Welcome to Georgia's Fantastic Tavern, an online festival of Georgian writers, and the first in a series of tavern encounters streamed to you by Writers House of Georgia in Tbilisi. Katie Meloa, singer, songwriter, composer, and arranger, is one of Britain's most successful musical artists. She sold more than 11 million albums and received more than 56 platinum awards. Her eight consecutive top 10 studio albums range from Call Off the Search in 2003 to In Winter with the Gory Women's Choir in 2019 and album number eight released last year, both recorded partly in Georgia. The writer Philip Pullman recently gave a succinct review on Twitter of her rendering of the Paul McCartney song Blackbird, which she posted there. Beautiful, he said but her own songwriting has come increasingly to the fore. Katie, welcome back to the tavern. Thank you. Yesterday at the launch, you sang a song in Georgian, your mother tongue. I wondered if you feel differently when you sing in Georgian rather than English and what your relationship is now to your mother tongue. Um, I definitely feel different when I sing in Georgian and it is difficult to pinpoint exactly what it is in the flavor of it. Um, I mean, often when I put a song together, if I'm in performance, I think about the words the most. A lot of my colleagues in the music industry, um, generally speaking, are you know deep into the music and the musical composition and then the sonics of instruments and then the production. Um, I've just always been someone that's been obsessed with the words, obsessed with the character that's in the song, with the atmosphere that the song is producing through the words. So, you know, when it came to singing the Georgian song to Asetopa Iravi, which was actually, I guess, my first time uh, putting a Georgian language song on an official studio recording, I don't know, there was something about it that felt really, um, very visceral. Um, I mean, the Georgian language itself is quite dramatic and operatic. You know, I'm sure people that are here at this event, you know, know something about what Georgian sounds like. You know, we have the very sort of guttural sounds like uh and uh. Um, and so it, there's just a bigger sort of space of volume and I guess passion. Um, English, on the other hand, has got the beauty in its subtlety. And so to me, I don't know, I really value the fact that I, you know, predominantly work in the English language, um, but I have, you know, the Georgian in my past. And also it's somewhere that, you know, we always traveled back to as a family. You know, and one of the things that I found incredibly sort of important and profound is that um, as someone that loves words and as someone who is deeply passionate about reading, um, I had two years of schooling in Georgia when I was younger. So the first two years of school, so around the age of six, seven, before we moved over to the UK. And, you know, in Georgia, most people, and this it's not a niche thing like maybe it is more so in, in England, um, most people are able to recite you like the equivalent of the King Lear or the equivalent of Romeo and Juliet, you know, because they really value poetry and they do really value literature. And it's just, it's just part of the sort of everyday culture that, you know, people are very in touch with this idea of speaking and using words in a kind of, in a masterful way. Um, so yeah, you know, for all those reasons, I really appreciate my, you know, my roots to Georgia. And, and of course, the, the Georgian Shakespeare is in, in a way, Shota Rustaveli, perhaps you're thinking of that, the knight in the panther skin. And we have the English translator of that work um, the, in, into verse, Lynn Coffin, the American poet, in the tavern on, on Sunday. But she, she said that there are more words, there's a bigger vocabulary in English, but Georgian has more rhymes. So I wondered if, if you will perhaps think of, of writing songs in Georgian at some point, because, partly to make use of that wonderful rhyming capacity. I'd absolutely love to. You know what, well, actually about five, five years ago, I started doing um, much more detailed research in lyric writing in the English language, you know, again, because that's 
you know, that's my field of expertise in terms of making records uh, for an English listening audience. Um, and, I, you know, I realized there was a bit of a, uh, there was something missing in terms of the level of sort of expertise and education that's available to us as lyricists, particularly in the sort of more popular jazz and blues influence spaces. Of course, when it comes to hip hop and rap, you know, it's culturally a very different space, but their lyrics are the king. Um, but in the type of songs that I make, it's, it seems to be much harder. It seems to be more mysterious. And so in looking at, um, you know, looking at the world of poetry, um, looking at the world of fiction writing, I was able to see that, you know, there are so many kind of, there are so many brilliant methods in those other spaces that we don't have yet in the record making world. And I'm really interested actually in bridging the gap between us and the record industry, um, where we do use words and then the literary space. So, so to answer your question, one of the things I did discover was translating is, you know, if you're lucky enough to be bilingual, um, is such a brilliant uh, exercise and, and thing to do to develop as a writer. And so, yeah, I'm really interested in eventually writing in Georgian, but I think I'm a little bit way off and I should probably start with looking at maybe doing, you know, some small translations. Mm -hmm. Although, I mean, I say small, obviously it's always a difficult and sort of challenging thing in an art form in itself. Absolutely. <laughs> um, you, you were born um, in Kutaisi in Georgia's second city and what was then Soviet Georgia. I wondered, um, I know you moved around as a child, but how would you describe the city? Um, do you still have a relationship with it? And also, what are your earliest musical memories? So my memories of Kutaisi, um, well, I guess my memories really kick in in sort of the late 80s and early 90s. And, you know, as most people know, we had a pretty tough decade in the 90s in Georgia. Um, so what I do remember is actually, I mean, this is going to sound really weird, but I remember how starry the nights were in Kutaisi, even though it was quite a, a sort of a, a big city after uh, Tbilisi. Um, I just remember beautiful starry nights. And I also recall, um, so this was where my grandma lived on my mum's side. She actually had a, you know, in the, after the breakup of the Soviet Union and the collapse of the country's sort of economy, not far from her house was, a, was an airport that had been abandoned, which was actually filled with helicopters and planes that were just left to rust. And this ended up being our playground. So, I mean, as you can imagine, being sort of like seven, eight, nine, because we would come back to Georgia during the summer holidays, we'd go to Kutaisi um, at this airport and you could just kind of climb inside these aircrafts. I think then, you know, as the 90s developed, they, they must have closed it off. But that's the sort of crazy memory that I remember of Kutaisi. And, uh, and I actually ended up writing a song about that called Plain Song. And it was on the album with the Gory Women's Choir, which was honestly one of the most incredible experiences I've, I've ever had working on a record because it meant going to Gori to record where the choir are based and it required us building a studio from scratch. Um, and, and yeah, it, it did bring up a lot of memories from Georgia and I kind of tried to capture the atmosphere that I remember from my memories of Georgia. And so what were, were your earliest musical memories? Oh yes. Kind of um, the background, the musical grounding that you had in Georgia? Well, when I've been asked about this, you know, I always say how in Georgia, you know, people are very close to the arts. And that means that, you know, in every household, someone will play the piano. Every household, someone will play the guitar. So when you have the, um, the big feasts that Georgia is really well known for, where you have a tamada who gives toasts, who gives thanks for, you know, everything, um, you'll also have you know, a few members of the family starting to perform. And in my family, it was my mum who would sit at the piano and she would perform beautiful classical pieces. Uh, one of the ones that had the most profound effect on me is, you know, the really famous uh, Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven. She'd play some of the beautiful um, uh, Chopin pieces. And 
I actually think it was a mixture of hearing these pieces in the night time when we didn't have electricity um, because the lights would go out in the 90s. I think it was that sort of listening to music with candlelight that had a very profound effect on me at such a young age. And also George's polyphonic singing, which is ancient as, as ancient as its winemaking. Um, and like winemaking, it's recognized by UNESCO as an intangible heritage of humanity. But I wondered if you can assess whether that polyphonic singing had an influence on the development of your own musical ear and whether it's you're using it increasingly now in your songwriting. I think it must have because when I first started working in the studio with Mike Bat, who is the composer that wrote songs like Close Thing to Crazy and Nine Million Bicycles, which ended up doing incredibly well, um, we were kind of also playing around with, with a bit of blues and a bit of jazz. And I mean, I had no formal training in blues or jazz whatsoever. But I was just loving the songs. I loved the classical quality that they had to them. And there was something that in those songs that I was able to just enter performing them very naturally. You know, and there would be certain improvisations I would do, which Mike as my producer, he would kind of be like, how, you know, how are you doing that? And I think that was when I realized that the, the ear, um, you know, my ear having heard Georgian music, where you have those kind of, not sort of equal temperament before between the notes, um, which is the Western way the scales are divided up, meant that I, I guess that's where that developed, where you could kind of be a bit freer, a bit more sort of slidey with your notes. So yeah, I think, you know, from that technical perspective, it did have a, a very, you know, sort of strong effect in helping me in the studio. Yes, and, and Zurab Karamidze, a writer who is going to be in the Digital Tavern on Sunday, um, is a historian of jazz and has talked about the, the link between jazz and, and Georgian polyphony and the, the affinities that there are between those two forms. Well, OK, I'm definitely going to be listening to that one then. <laughs> <laughs> Great. That's the finale event <laughs> on Sunday afternoon. Now, your father, I believe, um, is or was a doctor, a, a heart surgeon, is that right? He was a heart surgeon, he's now a GP. Okay, um, and you as a family, you left Georgia when you were eight years old, and but lived and came to the UK, but you lived first in Northern Ireland, um, near the Falls Road in Belfast. And I wondered if looking back, do you, you were very young then, but do you see any parallels between newly independent Georgia with the kind of conflicts that were going on then and Northern Ireland. And also, do you think that a history of troubles like that gives artists in, artists in those places a drive, an edge, do you think? Um, well, okay, so I think the similarities that I saw between Georgia and Belfast I really, it became clear when I then later moved to the to England. And that was the fact that the Irish, the Northern Irish were very um, loud and proud about their sort of Irish culture. You know, so, I mean, I went to a Catholic school and my brother ended up being sent to a Protestant school because we had no sort of political sort of affiliation with any side. So it just happened to be that way that the best schools for me happened to be a Catholic school, best one for Z Zorab, my brother was a Protestant school. And then at this Catholic school, they were just so, you know, proud to kind of share the Irish heritage. So they got me to learn the tin whistle. Um, there was Irish dancing, there was Irish language lessons. And then I remember when I came to England, you kind of, it, to find English culture, it's a lot, you got to look hard. <laughs> you know, it's not presented instantly to you. Um, you know, and of course, I mean, I'm not a sort of an English culture specialist, but there is, you know, I think in Northern Ireland, there is a sense of sort of pride uh, it, on the international space and kind of a showing off, um, which I, you know, which I really like. And then to your question about whether it gives artists an edge. Well, one thing is that, you know, you realize how precious life is and that you realize that it's you know, in order to achieve something in the world, you've got to work really hard. So I think it gives you a, 
I don't know, for me, it kind of gave me a sense of, of rigor. Um, and then also it, it gave, it also gives you a sense of naivety. So what I mean by that is um, by essentially leaving Georgia, which was going through, you know, terrible times, coming to Belfast and then coming to England, my parents literally thought that because we were now living in the country where Led Zeppelin and Queen were from, that was it. You know, so it's like the, the big hardship is over. And so everything else is much easier. So you kind of, you, you got this perspective, or at least we did. And, um, and now having been in the music industry for 15 years, I realized that way of thinking is kind of madness. <laughs> How, how exceptional your career was it wasn't the exactly yeah but you know from the perspective of coming where we came from we just thought well you know we now we can we live in this country in this free country where people get paid to make music and make records so it's basically a done deal <laughs> and so yeah I think there's there's different positives and of course negatives that coming from you know uh, an unusual background gives you mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned Mike Batt, who, who wrote so many of your, your major hits. Um, and you also mentioned in winter, um, the first record you really made after that six album deal. And that was with the, the Gory Women's Choir. Would you like to say a little more about what you gained from working with them? You've described the, the, the circumstances, but what, what, did you, what did you learn from that experience? Well, I, I kind of got to really see the influences in Georgian artists and Georgian culture, you know, and you really notice that, first of all, there is this kind of artistic flame, you know, that's there, in, I guess, because it's on the Mediterranean, it's a relatively hot country, it's surrounded by the mountains, which are very dramatic. Um, life, generally speaking, is very dramatic in Georgia, you know, it's it's not sedate and tranquil it's just you know because of the sort of the seriousness that people take friendships the the brotherhoods that are there um and so the art is kind of you know the artists sort of have that in their in their characteristics but then i think you also have the soviet influence because you know georgia was part of the soviet union for so long so you kind of have these i mean i remember the Gorymans Choir, they have this great vocal professor called Anzori Shomachia. And he um, he would say things to me like, remember what the Russians say about performing, that you have to have um, a cool mind, but a heart on fire. You know, so he'd come up with, you know, he'd sort of have all these Russian sayings that had come down from, you know, from the affiliation with Russian culture too. And then, you know, when you think about Russian literature and um, and the Russian sort of theatre stage, you know, those are those are very important and big um, kind of, in, yeah, great things in terms of the arts. So having these influences, I realised were brilliant. And, and so what I learned in working with a choir was they had this idea of perfectionism and very sort of studious approach, but in a way where the sort of the passion and the flow didn't, didn't get dampened by it or at least they seem to kind of accept that you can have both that you can't you don't have to just be a sort of a, a kind of a mind-based artist or a sort of a passionate artist that that there is this space somewhere in the middle or something that embraces the the, the two and so that was really important for me and and it's interesting you're talking about Russian culture as being also part of 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 Georgia's heritage in a way, or one of the, one of the many streams really. Um, but when you were in your early twenties, there was a five day war between Georgia and Russia. Um, I wondered what your view of that was, partly because speaking to some of the writers, they said that young Georgians had turned their back on Russian culture in the wake of that war in 2008, that it was, it was a move for them to, to, to not want to speak Russian or to know the Russian language or the culture, um, not simply the, the political aspect. So I wondered how you see that. I see it as something that is, that creates such heated debate. There's a great deal of passion around that topic. And I think my way of dealing it 
with it is to sort of almost disassociate myself from from the political space you know and of course i can do that because i'm you know i'm not in politics by any means and i'm in the arts mm -hmm. and so to me it's it's more about you know culturally and sort of creatively what what are people doing and i'm i'm more interested in in just the people you know um there is a brilliant charity russian charity that i work with here in london you know they look after um children who have cancer and you know and that's what the people that i know are doing they happen to be russian and there happens to have been a five-day war between russia and georgia but i don't know i just it's difficult, you know, I try and just compartmentalize it into that other space, which is politics. Um, and that's just my way of dealing with it. And also on the, the Gory Women's Choir album, the, In Winter, you recorded Rachmaninoff, um, at the Vespers, I think, as a, as a tribute, you said, to your grandfather, who was sent to a Siberian prison camp. Can you ex tell us a little about him? And also, how was that kind of history spoken about in your family as you were growing up? Well, it was it was drip fed in quite sort of humorous ways. When I was really young, you know, granddad would you know tell these stories of escaping from a Siberian labor camp, as and he was you know always presenting himself as this hero. And then, as I kind of got older, and I'd ask him, you know, more and more about it you know, you would realize actually, you know, the weight and the difficulty of it. Um, you know, and yeah, I mean, there was a couple of stories that I sort of was only able to hear when, when I reached my mid twenties. <laughs> um, and I also realized, you know, I, I kind of realized that actually the idea about him escaping the camp, I wasn't, wasn't actually accurate. You know, it was just something as part of the fairy tale element of you know, speaking to his grandkids when we were, I don't know, six, seven years old. Um, and yeah, it's just remarkable. It's, you know, you do as a 36 year old, I, I marvel at what our, you know, what the generations before us went to, went through. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's just incredible. And again, you know, I, I think about, I remember looking into Rachmaninoff and how he, he had to escape Russia um, you know, during the revolution, because he was from a really noble family. Um, but I guess, you know, when you listen to that, to those pieces, they are extraordinary, and they're just so exquisite. And, you know, to me, like, that's what matters, like, the power of those works are the most beautiful thing you'll hear. And so, I don't know, I think that feeling one has towards art towards great works of art is so strong and so profound it definitely helps me to kind of sort of move everything else in the other lanes in terms of the politics and the sort of the pain and the, you know and what i imagine to have been a horrific time uh, that my granddad would have had there you mentioned pain i mean You've written most of the songs on your latest album, album number eight, and it seems to mark a turning point. Every reviewer has said this, but also every listener will feel that it, it it's mark, marks a turning point in your songwriting. I wondered what kind of life experiences you're drawing on for this album, and also what's your approach to converting the painful in life into, into art? so that it doesn't become something that drags people down, but that it, it uplifts you. Well, maybe I could answer your second question first, which is, mm -hmm. I think it's like, I don't know, just complete and utter belief and dedication to the art form itself. You know, to me, songs are, you know, I mean, I can feel it in every part of my body and my brain that they are magical creations. You know, when I listen to them, other people's songs that have transformed me, like Imagine, like a lot of Bob Dylan's work, a lot of Joni Mitchell's work, a lot of Hoagie Ma Co, Co Michael's work. Um, they are so transformative. And so I think there's something about the act of creating that lets you, um, yeah, it lets you heal as you create, because also the process of writing is really addictive. 
And then in terms of the life experience as well, you know, the record talks a lot about, I guess, time with my family. Um, there's a song called Leaving the Mountain, which is about this sort of frustration between spending and having a wonderful time with my dad in the Georgian mountains, but then having to go back to work and, you know, that pool of family time versus, you know, time in the workplace and how we kind of divide those two areas up. Um, I, you know, went through a divorce. Uh, it was amicable, but of course, you know, there was a lot that I had to kind of process of that. And so, you know, I kind of wanted to, yeah, to, to write to, to James, my ex-husband, in a way that was respectful, that was dignified, um, but also that tells a story. And, and I don't know, I think it's just the, the knowledge that songs can handle it. You know, songs can handle anything. They can handle your pain, but they can also, if you choose to, they can show you how to sort of layer it up, you know, so that it's not just, as you say, it doesn't weigh people down you know, because I guess, I don't know, you just try and reflect life as it is. And to me, you know, life has so many layers. It has, you know, we have to go through difficulties and pain and then how do we deal with that? And I try and get the songs to capture all of that. And I don't know how, how you feel about talking about this now, but about 10 years ago, you went through a very difficult period um, and you stopped working for a while and you're in hospital, but I wondered if that was a dark time that you're also drawing on in your writing and your performing, particularly your performing of songs. Well, possibly. The thing is, you know, songs can just let you kind of enter this invisible architecture. And it's, yeah, it's extraordinary how they really seem to, the combination of the words and the music just seems to sort of spark things, you know, and you, you know, you can have revelations when you sing songs, like I'll have issues maybe going on at home or just, you know, sort of, I don't know, some politics going on in my life. And I'll, I might sing a song and it will suddenly give me clarity. And that's such a beautiful thing. Um, but yeah, in terms of, you know, yeah, I had a very sort of, publicly documented uh, breakdown in 2010 and all I can say is I'm just very grateful that I recovered from it um, and yeah it's part of my past uh, and it is what it is but you kind of have to just marvel at medicine at the people that looked after me at my family and yeah I'm just grateful that I'm still able to make music and work Something else about your latest album, though, that I wanted to ask is that it was made partly recorded in Tbilisi um, and with the Georgian Philharmonic Orchestra. How do you find the city, the, the vibrant Tbilisi as a place to work and create? And what was it like to work with this orchestra? It was amazing to work with Nick Racioli's orchestra. Um, the city is phenomenal. And what has blown my mind is the transformation of, well, yeah, Tbilisi in particular, but to me also in the last five years. So, I mean, I remember when I first went there to work with the Gorium Choir project, uh, you know, it was starting to develop and grow and, and the arts were starting to kind of be more visible. But these days, you know, when I go to Georgia before the pandemic, of course, um, I'll see so many musicians on the street, you know, performing. There's so many like concerts happening. There's, you know, there'll be a, a little homemade art gallery pretty much on every corner. And, and yeah, as you say, it's really vibrant and it's, it's the vibe is just great. You know, it's, I don't know, it's almost like what I'd imagine maybe Woodstock was like, you know, in the early seventies. So yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. And the orchestra is brilliant. That recording studio is also a fantastic place to record in. Um, it's now called Leno Records. And it used to be where all the old George film soundtracks, the Georgian film soundtracks were recorded. So yeah, it's brilliant. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time, Katie, but it's been such a pleasure speaking to you. Um, and I hope you'll join us in the, in the tavern um, to see some of these wonderful writers uh, speaking about Georgia and their work. 
Thank you so much. Thank you very much.